Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the second uh, of two Monticello live streams in honor of Virginia Archaeology Month. I'm uh, Fraser Nyman, Director of Archaeology here at Monticello, and I'm here today with one of our research collaborators, uh, Dr. Dan Drickenbrod. Uh, Dan is Professor of Environmental Sciences at, in, at Ryder University and Chair of the Department of uh, Geological, Environmental, and Marine Sciences. Uh, so Dan is a veritable Renaissance man. Uh, he uh, uses methods drawn from dendrochronology and forest ecology to study forest history and historical patterns of, of land use. Uh, Dan's work is allowing us to understand how spatial variation in the species of trees we see around us today at Monticello and critically in their annual growth rings are actually valuable sources of evidence about historical patterns of human land use stretching back over several centuries. Uh, they, they therefore have the potential to help us advance our understanding of Jefferson's designs of the ornamental and agricultural landscapes that together comprised all of Monticello plantation and also the lives of all of Monticello's residents, uh, both enslaved and free. Uh, Dan has been working with us since the early 2000s, uh, starting with an initial foray into the woods along the second roundabout here at Monticello, just right outside the archaeology lab, right out the window behind me here. Um, uh, and it, at that time, it, uh, Dan and uh, Mike Mann, uh, who's now at Penn State, and Ed Cook uh, from Lamont Doherty at Columbia, and I uh, sort of walk down the roundabout equipped with some increment corers. You'll see one of those in a minute at where we selectively coral, uh, cored white oaks and shortleaf pines. And I was astounded to discover uh, that there are a substantial number of trees uh, out there dating to the 18th century. So that was the beginning of a really fascinating uh, uh, chunk of research, uh, fascinating results about Monticello's forest history. Uh, and that has really made important contributions to our larger understanding about uh, shifting Monticello plantation landscapes. So, but that's Dan's story. And uh, the great news is he's here to tell it. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to him. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction, Frazier. Uh, it's a privilege to have this opportunity to share with you all a little bit about what we have been working on these last two decades with the forest history of Monticello. I have some slides that I hope to share with you here momentarily, but before doing that, I thought it'd be helpful to give a little bit of background context with both the ecology of the mountain and also uh, some of the methods that we use to, as Fraser said, uh, study the growth rates in the rings of these trees over time. So just quickly, uh, particularly since it's fall, and it's easy to find uh, samples like this. Uh, we'll be learning about oak trees, and you probably many of you have seen leaves like this that are a quintessential oak leaf. So this is one of the species that we'll be learning about this afternoon. Um, another one is tua poplar or yellow poplar, depending upon which common name you want to use. And this species is, um, I don't know, a pretty distinctive leaf because it's got sort of what often people will call a cat face to it. So it has two ears and the whiskers coming out from either side. So that's a yellow poplar or a tua poplar. And then also pines. And I didn't bring any needles. Those might be hard to show. But of course, um, pine cones like southern pines, like shortleaf pine or Virginia pine, figure uh, large in this story that we'll be sharing this afternoon. Uh, also in this story, we'll be learning about uh, tree rings, of course. So this is a core, or actually a cross section from a fallen tree. Um, we sampled with chainsaws and trees that had fallen naturally and were able to get uh, full discs out of them. This is very helpful. In fact, this is uh, the one that I'm holding. I'll show you a better picture of this shortly. But this is the oldest tree that we found on Monticello Mountain. So this tree dates back to 1727, which is what, 40 some years prior to when Jefferson began building his home of Monticello on that mountain. So this is a really neat one. Uh, we, of course, though, also sampled uh, living trees non-destructively, and I'll show a picture of this a little bit later. But when we do that, we can pull out long sort of straw-shaped samples of wood from um, trees using a hand drill. And these allow us to look at the rings. So this is a pine core coming along here. And you can see as we go from the bark on this point 
in towards the center of this tree where the rings start arcing around, we uh, got pretty close to center on this tree that started growing in the 1940s, 1946 is the earliest ring. As compared to, again, this is an oak tree, a longer core with more narrow rings, if you can see those, that dates back to 1824, so two years prior to Jefferson's death. Uh, so this is some of the methods. We um, not only look at these cores visually, but of course we uh, use microscopes to help make sure that we are both seeing the cores in all their detail, but also can measure them accurately. And statistics that we generate from the measurements of their ring widths allows us to ensure that we've dated these cores accurately we dated the ages of the trees accurately because they share a common climate signal. So that method is really important and uh, underlies a lot of the research I hope to share with you this afternoon. So with that background context, uh, if we could switch to the slides, I'll give a little bit of an overview. And I'd like to start with this quote. This is from an English traveler in 1817, nine years before Jefferson passes away. And uh, he is reminiscing upon what it was like to approach Monticello Mountain at that time. I won't read the whole quote, but just uh, to give you a sense, he writes, having an introduction to Mr. Jefferson, I ascended his little mountain on a fine morning which gave the situation its due effect. The whole of the sides and base are covered with forest, through which roads have been cut circularly so the winding may be shortened at, at pleasure. So you get the sense, as this photo shows, that Monticello was heavily forested at that time, which is an intriguing sort of uh, observation to wrestle with. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see on this next slide that um, this is actually quite similar to the landscape that you would encounter if you have the opportunity to visit Monticello today. When you arrive at Monticello today, you arrive through the entrance road with the bridge off of Route uh, what is it, 27 in the lower left corner of this aerial photograph. And right, and as you move in, you, you park sort of uh, at the visitor center. Thanks, that's great. And uh, as you go from that entrance road to the visitor center, you're surrounded by forests on your way in around the walking paths. Um, and it's only really still the summit of the house that's shown with that arrow uh, labeled main house that is open ground today. Um, so that's the the bulk of the visitor experience, uh, appropriately enough, is, is focused on the house and Mulberry Row and the people who would have lived there, right? But in addition to Jefferson's family, we know that Monticello was home to um, many more people, right? That Jefferson owned over 600 enslaved individuals during his time at Monticello. And many of those would have lived and worked across this larger Monticello home quarter. So there is a black line that sort of traces around the outline of the 600 acre really agricultural plantation at that time that has largely reverted back to nature. It's reverted back to forest today. So part of what's exciting, as Fraser mentioned, about this research collaboration is the opportunity to investigate this landscape and see what evidence remains of this past plantation agriculture and just how these forests have returned um, to to the present day, and as well as what force might remain from Jefferson's time uh, here at Monticello as well. So with that, let me go to the next slide. So this is really um, a great way to understand that historical landscape from Jefferson's time. And this, uh, what I'm showing here, is a product of many decades of archeological research by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation at Monticello. And you can clearly see the uh, location of fields that are common across the right-hand side or the eastern and southeastern slopes of Monticello Home Farm. Uh, these fields have been documented through Jefferson's own surveys, but also through archeological research, as Frazier mentioned in his lightning talk the other week. Um, and then as Derek mentioned in his uh, lightning talk, Derek Wheeler, that the road network is now well understood also are at Monticello with these circular roads that uh, Jefferson referred to as roundabouts, extending from uh, just around the main house as the first roundabout and then progressively working um, down at lower elevations around the mountain. Uh, what's interesting about this is that we can now start to get a sense of this larger landscape from a human history 
Uh, for instance, Site 6 that Fraser mentioned in his talk the other day is shown here. It's just one example of the archaeological sites that they have been actively excavating in recent years. So what I hope to share with you is just the story of how this former agricultural plantation reverted back to forest and how that former land use remains apparent in these woods from uh, Jefferson's time to the present day. Perhaps sort of the most intriguing part of this Jefferson landscape, or at least the most initially confusing part, was Jefferson's reference to an area called the Timber Zone. This zone was inspired by Jefferson's tour of English estates, as Derek mentioned in his lightning talk, but it wasn't explicitly mapped by Jefferson. In fact, the only direct reference to its location exists on a scrap of paper attached to a larger survey of Monticello Mountain. That text lists surveying measurements and poles as reference from the North Spring, shown with that blue dot in the top of this slide. Uh, Jefferson mentioned that zone extended over 100 acres, but he didn't really draw where those acres occurred. In fact, his exact quote is, above the timber zone are 80 acres. The circuit of the timber zone at its upper limit is 400 poles. At its lower limit, 600 poles. Its breadth must be 31 and a half poles to make its contents 100 acres. If we can go to the next slide, we can see that after sort of wrestling with this as a, a group, um, we came to the realization that what Jefferson was referring to was basically a belt of trees that extended from the second roundabout around the main house down through the third roundabout to the fourth roundabout. So basically what's shown here in sort of a light shaded green that envelops Monticello Mansion as sort of a donut, if you will, or a belt going around that house. What we can infer from this is that Jefferson was basically literally doing a back of the envelope calculation. Um, he was estimating the distances of 400 poles and 600 poles because that if you use uh, those circumferences for circles, you get the exact areas of uh, 80 acres and 180 acres respectively that give you that difference of a 100 acre timber zone. So um, that was really helpful for framing this landscape and also framed a research hypothesis for us. Um, if it was true that Jefferson had a timber zone and we also know that he had a park to the south of it, a deer park, and as well as a grove that would have been flanking the edge of that west lawn uh, from the main house. And then lastly, some uh, documentary evidence that there were trees along the steep north, north slope down towards the Ravana River. Uh, if all of those documents are true, then those areas shaded either in green or that green cross hatching are the areas where we would expect to have the best chances to find Jefferson era trees that might remain to this day. In contrast, we wouldn't expect to find trees on the right hand side of Monticello home quarter or Monticello home farm because that area would have been heavily agricultural during Jefferson's time as he grew tobacco uh, and then transitioned into wheat, all with the uh, all using enslaved labor over time. So to test this hypothesis, we have been looking at ages of tree rings. And if we can go to the next slide, I'll give you a sense of what this looks like out in the field. So uh, this is a great photo that shows two Monticello Field School students uh, sampling a pine tree at Monticello. And this is really uh, also just a great photo to share because it's a testament to all the, the uh, great work that Monticello Field School students have done every summer to help build up the database that I'm sharing with you this afternoon and um, their ability to just help collect research grade data. So as you can see, they're both holding a hand drill and um, you literally take that hand drill, you, you crank it into a tree like you might with any drill, but it's a hollow drill. And that pulls out that small cylinder of wood, straw shaped, that then we can mount and sand and look under a microscope. So it becomes a very uh, powerful and non-destructive way to understand the forest history of the site. And it's used as a method across the world. With that method in mind, let me just give you a little bit of more detailed understanding of what these tree rings are like. So we're going to go to the next slide here, and I'll show you those uh, cross sections that I have on the bench behind me. Uh, the oak is the 1727 oak on the bottom that uh, started growing before Jefferson was even living at Monticello. Um, the pine above is a pine that is much younger. 
and it started growing on, um, I think in 1917 was its earliest reign. So what's interesting, of course, is that even though the oak was almost 300 years of age and the pine is a third of that age, you can see the size of these two cross sections are similar. So the pine must have grown much more rapidly. And if we zoom in on the right-hand side of this graph, as you see, uh, the rings on that pine are much wider, particularly when it was young. And that tells us something, that that pine was growing in an environment where it was able to grow lots of wood uh, and thus do lots of photosynthesis, which is only possible if it was getting lots of sunlight. So consistently wide rings there to suggest to me that it is indicative of a tree that was growing into an open environment, one where sunlight was plentiful and um, you can imagine that being an abandoned farm field. In contrast, the oak rings that are probably even hard for you to make out on a screen, but you can see there are some very, very um, narrow rings on this oak, and they remain narrow all the way into the center. Uh, and it might be a little bit tricky to see because this was an oak that was already starting to decay somewhat. You can see there are holes from uh, organisms that were starting to break down this wood, but we're fortunate that we were able to sample this before it decayed completely. Those rings tell a very different story. They tell a story of a tree that was growing in very low light, a low light environment underneath a shaded forest canopy uh, for many years before it finally became a canopy tree itself. So um, with that context in mind, we're gonna, I'm going to show some uh, slides later that will talk about trees and their ages, but we'll also refer to them as growing quickly because they um, were in full sun conditions or more slowly like this oak because they were growing in shaded conditions. And that difference helps us to interpret the ecology as well as the human history on this landscape all the more. So uh, thank you for that. Let's go on to the next slide. What's also helpful in interpreting this property is the earliest set of aerial photographs that were flown by our country in the 1930s. So this is a 1937 black and white aerial photograph showing the Monticello home quarter, again, with the main house uh, label, just to give you a reference. Um, and there's a lot we can glean from this photo because it is taken at high altitude and gives us this accurate picture of what the landscape was like uh, almost a century ago. And in terms of the ecology, we can glean some things immediately from looking at this. For example, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, you can see sort of the gray textured areas denotes deciduous forests. So these would be forests like oak trees that are losing their leaves currently at this time of year. The sort of smooth gray areas that um, surround the house and extend off to the right from the house are open fields. And then the last sort of cover that I'd hope to explain to you here is that if you go further to the right from that, you can see there's some darker textured areas as well. Those darker textured areas are evergreen trees. So pines, like the pine cone that I was sharing with you earlier. To give you a sense of this, since um, it may not be an image you're used to looking at, if we go to the next slide, you can see uh, a different aerial from Monticello at about the same time. So this is an oblique aerial taken, um, actually I'm not sure how it was taken, maybe by some sort of a balloon or airplane. Uh, but you can see that same sort of color difference comes out with the smooth gray texture being the open ground, um, the dark textured areas being evergreens, and also the lighter uh, gray textured areas, particularly in the upper left corner again, uh, being deciduous trees off in the distance. If you remember, and if you've uh, had a chance to sort of learn about forest and forest ecology and forest succession here in eastern deciduous forests, as well as other places around the world, you might recall that often abandoned land progresses through a sequence where you have open ground, open abandoned fields reverting into perhaps shrubs and brambles, what you might think of as briars. Uh, and then from those shrubs that progresses into pine trees, and then from pine trees that progresses into a deciduous forest, a progression that can take upwards of a century. What's really neat about this photograph is off in the distance and sort of the top right and the top center, you can kind of see some evidence of uh, that open land being uh, naturally reverting back into shrubs and pines and eventually deciduous forests. So um, 
this becomes a, a useful set of imagery to help us interpret the landscape along with these tree rings. So with that, let me show you where we sample tree rings across the property on our next slide. So this slide, which might be another one that could benefit if we can zoom in, um, shows the location with a uh, different colored circle across the property of every tree that we sampled over the past um, almost two decades. And um, this data set includes almost 300 trees. The trees that are the only trees that we don't have exact locations for, so we don't have dots represented, are those trees that Fraser mentioned at the very start from our initial foray, uh, heading out from the archaeology lab and walking around and, and just coring some trees in that red sort of shaded area. Um, we found a record um, um, several trees in that area that I'll speak about more later. But basically, what we can do is using this 1937 aerial photograph, we can kind of group all these 300 trees into different subclasses, depending upon what type of land cover they were present in, in 1937. So for instance, on the lower right hand corner, um, where I have 1930s open ground with a bright green dot, all of those trees are in locations that appear on the 1937 aerial to be open ground. So they don't appear yet to have returned to forest. Um, where there's darker green dots, um, those appear to be evergreen. So they're around the darker green stippling pattern in the 1930s. And then where there's red, um, those are areas, particularly around the house and around the timber zone, that are trees that are sampled within um, the area that, in terms of documents, maps to Jefferson's timber zone. So those should be really intriguing, and I'll share those results here in a moment. Uh, but let's start with uh, this open ground in the 1937. So if we go to the next slide, this slide shows a histogram of the ages of the trees that we found in those open fields on the 1937 aerial. And it does so basically by showing um, which species there were by different colors. So oaks that are shown in blue, pine trees are shown in red, and yellow poplars are shown in yellow. Um, what you notice and why there are two sets of um, legends, if you will, for each species is that trees that are growing quickly when they're young are shaded with a lighter color. Trees that are growing more slowly are shaded with a darker color. So trees that are growing more quickly are trees that were likely growing in open conditions. Uh, trees that were growing more slowly are likely growing in what we call closed canopy or underneath an established forest canopy at that time. What this histogram shows, the sort of the takeaway of all of this, is that most trees entered into this open ground area in the 1930s and 1940s. And most of those trees were pines, and most of those pines were growing quickly. So this is a good, if you will, uh, just test, as we would expect, that in an open field, pines should be the first tree that arrive, and those pines should be growing quickly because they are getting plenty of sunlight. So that's a good um, understanding of the open ground on the 1937 aerial. If we then shift to the next slide, we'll go to the evergreen cover on the 1937 aerial. And here you can see the story is somewhat similar. Again, pines are the first trees that are coming in, but they're coming in a little bit earlier. They're coming in at a time a decade or two earlier than we saw in the open ground. So these are arrived in the 1910s and the 1920s. Interestingly enough, this ties back into Site 6, right, and helps explain, as Frazier mentioned in his talk, why uh, there weren't foundations present at Site 6, because this was former agricultural land at that time and would have been plowed. But we can see here, too, that the, the story becomes a little more detailed, because it's not just pines that we find in this area. We also see yellow poplars coming in, and then several decades later, into the 1960s, oaks starting to come in, and those oaks are growing slowly, suggesting that they're gradually making their way up underneath this forest canopy of uh, overtopping pines and yellow poplars. And as they do so, they will eventually become the dominant tree. So this is an example of this forest successional sequence played out from this 1937 aerial evergreen cover. With that in mind, let me then switch to um, where we found the oldest trees. 
So if we go to the next slide, we'll see on this slide that we're now looking at the trees that were in Thomas Jefferson's timber zone, that were in its grove, and that were in the park, uh, as well as those trees uh, that were initially cored, so that are present in that uh, red polygon area. Uh, and you can see here, as evidenced by the much longer graph that I have across the bottom of the slide, that our trees are much older. And this is exciting, right, to find that we have trees going back um, to the 1720s. So that first small little blue bar that's on the very left of this graph is that 1727 tree. That's the oldest tree on this landscape. So we see that there are a couple of old oaks that are present around this area or in this area um, that were growing slowly initially. But then we see by the time that Jefferson's really starting to design this landscape and really starting to build Monticello in the 1770s and 80s, that we start to see pines coming in as well, suggestive that there was some disturbance, but perhaps some forest cover still remaining at that area. And then as we get into the early 1800s, the early 19th century, uh, we can see that oaks start coming in, but they often start coming in at a fast growth rate, shown by that lighter gray blue, or lighter blue shading. Uh, and that suggests that there must have been pockets where oaks were getting plenty of sunlight. Um, and that pattern continues all the way up to the 1850s and 1860s during the Civil War um, with additional trees that are continuing to recruit into this forest canopy up to the present day, of course. Uh, so what's really neat about this is we still see some evidence of forests that were from Jefferson's time, but we also see some evidence of that successional progression going from uh, pines that were growing rapidly in the 1770s and 1780s and then transitioning into oaks that establish uh, later in time. So this is really neat and sort of cuts to the, the chase, if you will, uh, about the history of our force and allows us to return back to this initial hypothesis as to whether or not um, this part of the landscape is really where we found the Jefferson era trees. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show here just a dot for every tree with a location um, that extended back to Jefferson's time. So every white dot on this map shows uh, the location of a tree that would have been growing when Jefferson was alive. In addition to that, in that red polygon area, we found 17 other additional trees that dated to Jefferson's time as well. So we have a total of uh, 36 trees that dated back to Jefferson's time, not all of which are still alive, some of which of course had fallen, like the oak that I showed earlier, but uh, all of which that we were able to use tree ring records to conclusively statistically demonstrate that they are that old. Looking at this data set, you can see that all of these trees are either within or very near those areas that our initial hypothesis expected, that they're all either within the park, the timber zone, or the north slope around Monticello, and none of these trees were found out in the more agricultural portions of the landscape further to the east. So that's neat support of our hypothesis. Uh, with that support of our hypothesis, um, we can then ask this question, well, why? Why is it that Jefferson uh, had trees there? As Fraser also alluded to in his live stream the other week, uh, there's a cost to having trees growing around one's uh, one's home and around Mulberry Row when trees were in such demand for, for fuel as a resource as well as for construction. So by not using timber that would have been in the timber zone or trees that would have been in the park or on the north slope, Jefferson is um, and is asking his enslaved individuals to exert more effort to find that fuel and that wood for construction elsewhere. Uh, perhaps in Mon Alto, which is shown sort of extending off into the lower left corner of this slide. So the question might be, you know, well, why exert this extra effort or why have um, people exert this extra effort? And it comes back to perhaps Jefferson's uh, view of status in the colonial world. So if we switch to the next slide here, we'll see that Jefferson was well aware of what an English estate should look like. Not only, as Derek mentioned, has he had the opportunity to travel to England and see English estates firsthand, uh, but he was also aware of woodlands and an estate in Philadelphia owned by William Hamilton that uh, Jefferson continued, uh, considered to be the only rival of the estates he had seen in England. 
So this is an excerpt from a draft letter that Jefferson uh, wrote in July 1806, uh, where he is writing to William Hamilton and explaining, Jefferson is explaining his aesthetic, if you will, in designing the landscape of Monticello and how he's trying to emulate an English garden, even though it's a very difficult form, if you will, to manage at that point. Uh, but it, interestingly enough, he explains in quite detail that these landscapes include the northern quadrant, that north slope of a mountain, for about two-thirds of its height, and then they spread around the upper third for its whole crown, alluding to that belt of trees that we know as the timber zone. Um, in total, they contain about 300 acres. They are chiefly still in their native woods, which are majestic and generate a very close undergrowth, which, has, which I've suffered not to be touched. Uh, so we can get a sense here that Jefferson is perhaps trying to impress William Hamilton. What's really intriguing about this letter is that it seems to have not been sent. So it seems to have just been a draft letter um, that perhaps for whatever reason, Jefferson chose not to deliver to William Hamilton. With that in mind, um, if we could go to the next slide, I'd like to just sort of give a summary um, as a start to a conclusion of what we've seen um, from these slides today. And I hope this presentation has provided insight into the forests as well as the agricultural history of the Monticello home mountain for you. Uh, while the fields that the archaeologists and historical documents uh, have identified on the southeastern side, while those fields are no longer present and have reverted back to forests through natural processes, we can now appreciate that there's really a lot of agricultural and uh, ecological history contained within the forests that flank the sides of Monticello today. I'd like to leave you with one other um, sort of image of Monticello that is an artistic image, if we go to the next slide, that was painted by Jefferson's granddaughter, um, perhaps in 1868. This is a watercolor looking up at Monticello Mountains from the lowlands around it, and um, it's looking up from an angle where you would have seen those uh, agricultural fields that were apparently still present in the late 1860s after the Civil War. Um, that gives you a very different sense of what Monticello Mountain may have looked like in Jefferson's time than the one that is completely forested today. Uh, and that, I think, helps us to appreciate how an initial quote, like I shared with you from Lieutenant Francis Hall, might have led to a visitor experience that seemed like Monticello Mountain was all forested because of the way that they approached the mountain. But in actuality, Monticello Mountain had substantial amounts of agriculture on it as well. So um, I would like to end by just sharing a few acknowledgments because this has been clearly a, a collaborative project from the get-go. If we could go to the next slide, um, there have been a lot of people, as Fraser mentioned, Ed Cook, Michael Mann, uh, Camille Moells, uh, also helped with the initial sampling. Um, a lot of expertise with Monticello Mountain from William Weiswanger to Peter Hatch, um, Hank Schuger, a professor at UVA, and uh, Neil Peterson at Harvard Forest for their assistance, as well as all the myriad uh, archaeology field school students, uh, undergraduates at Longwood University and Ryder University, um, and particularly some of the names I mentioned there. Um, and then lastly, of course, um, thanks to the Thomas Jefferson Foundation as well as Ryder University for their uh, support. If you would like to learn more about this research, the final slide I have for you is uh, shows a couple links. Um, for the article that was just published by Fraser and I, uh, as well as colleagues David Richardson and Derek Wheeler, um, in the Journal of Vegetation Science, that gives a more detailed story of what I've shared with you today, uh, as well as an article that I did with a student here at Ryder University on uh, what used to be the two twin poplars that flanked uh, the west side of Monticello, shown in this photograph. Uh, they had, had to be removed because they were getting old and were close to the house, of course. Um, but we dated one that was hollow back to the 1850s, and the one that's off in the distance with more leaves actually dates back to Jefferson's time. So that was really interesting. Uh, and then lastly, a book by Ed Cook that will give you an overview of treating science and all of its applications today. So with that, thank you for your time today, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have.
I think Fraser, your microphone might be. Oops. Yes, muted. It's it's remarkable how after what almost two years now of pandemic, I'm still learning to unmute my microphone. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thank you, Dan. That was a great talk. Um, I, I'd encourage any of you uh, who have questions, please type them into the chat uh, or the comments, um, and Dan will, will, be, will be happy to answer them. Uh, I might just start off by putting Dan on the spot and asking him to, I don't know, talk a little bit about, you know, is, is uh, does the dendro dendro chronology world uh, do much collaboration with archaeology? Is that kind of a standard thing, or are we just sort of weird outliers in the in in, in the research uh, world in this regard? Yeah, we may be weird outliers, but uh, but fortunately not so in the tree ring and uh, archaeology sense. I think, uh, as as you know, the collaboration goes back really to the founding of tree ring science um, with work done um, by Douglas out in Southwest looking at dating Pueblos using tree rings, um, ancient or old sites that were difficult to really narrow down a construction date, but tree rings with their annual dating provided an opportunity to, to do just as much. Um, but if you, if you fast forward to the present day, um, I would say that collaboration, particularly interdisciplinary collaboration, is a necessity anymore because if you're trying to tackle something as complex as a site like Monticello, you really have to appreciate the human story, which is coming from archaeology and historical documents, as well as the ecological story in tandem to to get a comprehensive picture. Great, thank you. And actually, I think there was a there was a earlier question, I believe, I believe from uh, Chester about, and I, you touched on this briefly about um, how far uh, uh, folks had who were living on the mountaintop, and this I guess would include not only Jefferson but also people living on Mulberry Row, uh, how far they had to go to get uh, firewood. Um, and I know you've done some work on um, on. Uh, on Mont Alto, so uh, yeah. Yeah, um, and Mont Alto is the larger adjacent hill to Monticello, and what's intriguing about that mountain is that its southeast slope is also cleared. And as far as you look back in time with uh, aerial photographs and early drawings and renderings of the property, that field largely is present. So um, one possibility is that that field was cleared uh, perhaps to grow crops, but as much um, to provide a source of uh, fuel and timber for the larger Monticello plantation as well. It would have been a harder field, um, I imagine, to do agriculture on because it's just such a steep field uh, heading up the slope of that mountain. We have found some old trees. I didn't include those in our totals today, but we have found a few trees on that mountain as well that date back to Jefferson's time. Uh, but those were far, far away from Monticello. Okay, thanks. And then uh, Peggy asks um, if uh, conifers, including cedars, put on double rings in some years. Uh, I, I think we've encountered some of this difficulty. Uh, I guess some trees are are well behaved, others are less so. Yes, that's exactly right. So um, the advantage of statistics is that you can get some confidence as to whether or not uh, each biological ring exactly correlates to a calendar year. And what we know is that oaks and, and pines are pretty good um, recorders, right? They're, they're good at chronology on one year with one ring through time. Uh, cedars can be more difficult. So for that reason, in fact, I didn't show any of the cedar uh, data today because um, you can imagine a tree that might start growing early in the season, but then has that growth interrupted, maybe because of drought, maybe because of frost, um, as that growth resumes, you might have actually two tree rings for one calendar year. So that's the, the type of thing that you need to be concerned about when studying tree rings. Yeah, great. And then I think maybe I'll take one here uh, from Emily who asks, uh, what happened to the tu to the uh, wood from the two tulip poplars uh, huh. that you guys cored? Um, do, you, do you have samples or? Yeah, we have samples. Um, I don't know if I can easily pull them down. Um, you can see I have um, lots of samples behind me. Um, 
but they are here and they are dated as part of this tree ring lab archive that are here. And I think there's actually a full disk. I only have smaller pieces of them uh, from the center to the bark, but I think there's a full disk actually in the archaeology lab as well. Yeah. So yeah. that's a great thing. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty sure, and I think uh, Melanie was going to put this uh, some more info in the in the chat. Uh, I believe there are uh, bowls made out of those that uh, folks can, um, yeah, uh, purchase online in the in the uh, in the shop. So, um, let's see. Uh, do we have any other uh, questions here? Ah, ah, yes. And Chester asks. This is a great one. What, what can you tell about weather from looking at tree rings? Yeah, um, so hearkening back to that initial collaboration between uh, tree ring scientists and archeologists, it's uh, deciphering past climate is the main application of tree ring science or dendrochronology as it's known. So uh, one can tell a fair amount. And um, what one learns about weather varies upon the location that you're at in the world where we are in the mid-Atlantic, where Monticello is, and even where Ryder University is here in New Jersey, um, trees are most sensitive to summer drought. And if you're a gardener, you're, you're well aware of that, right? That's the most stressful time of year for a plant to survive. Um, so if there is a summer with a particularly pronounced drought, the tree ring will be much more narrow that year um, versus a, a summer that has beneficial growing conditions all summer long that will lead to more wood production. So um, one can infer a fair amount. We haven't done climate reconstructions from these trees at Monticello per se, but um, there are larger networks. Uh, Ed Cook has done a larger network across North America that allows us to look at Monticello's climate in that context. Okay, well, thank you very much. So I think that brings us to the end of our session today. Um, I'd like to thank Dan once again for his time and sharing his research uh, with everyone. Um, I also want to invite you, you all to join us next week uh, for another in our ongoing uh, series of, uh, of live streams from Monticello. Um, so thanks very much and have a great afternoon.